Hi everyone, welcome to English 125 and today I'm going to talk to you about drama. Um, we are starting a new unit and in this unit we're going to be reading uh, a variety of different kinds of plays and so I want to give you some background on reading and writing um, about plays and just kind of some general information about drama so that you have and a better idea of what you're reading and what you're doing. So, how we read. When we read, we compare text to other texts and to our experiences in real life. Your ability to draw on prior reading experiences will be enhanced by your familiarity with the text's literary, cultural, historical, and critical context. Knowing a bit about the author or the topic of a play will help make understanding it significantly easier. And in some of the um, short stories that we've read, I've kind of given you a little bit of background about your authors. We'll go into a little bit more depth in um, this particular unit when we're looking at our plays. We'll find out as much information as we can about the authors, about the period when the piece was written that we are um, uh, studying, what's going on historically, that kind of thing. When you're writing about drama, um, there are lots of different elements to write about when you're talking about a play. You can look at plot stru structure, the presence or absence of characters um, or ac actions on stage, the different degrees of awareness of characters and audience at different points in the action, title, stage direction, stylistic details, themes, music, all different kinds of things. There's, there's just, it goes on and on. And I just tell you this because I want you to be thinking about these kinds of um, details and, and items when you're reading so that you, um, when you're reflecting and writing about drama, you have some ideas of, of some of the I topics that you can uh, draw upon. So the production of a play is um, unique. Every single time that a play is performed, it is different. Because human beings are performing it, um, many times in professional theater, the same actors don't perform um, night after night. We all have different actors um, play different roles sometimes. Um, so that in and of itself is different. Uh, and there can be any numerous uh, different interactions between set designers and lighting. Even the lines that the um, player or the actors say may vary from performance to performance. It just really depends on um, how the play is meant to be performed, how what the director's vision is of the, of the performance and, and where it goes from there. Most plays have three different levels of time. The first is the plot time and that's what you're most familiar with. That's first this happens, then that happens, then next this happens. There's also the authorial time, which is the period in which the author was actually writing the play. What was going on then? And then there's the reader or performance time. For example, a play that was written in 1950 and, is, and performed today may not look at all the same. Um, the performance time has changed even though you know, it was written in a particular time. So the director wants to modernize it. Maybe the sets are different. Um, it's, it's in a different setting that's um, more relevant or more timely. Um, topics that are addressed might be partic to a, or might have to do with a particular historical time. So all of these impact um, your performance. Stages. There are many different types of stages. Um, the proscenium stage, the thrust stage, and the arena stage are the most common, um, and most plays are performed on proscenium stages. But I want to show you some pictures of different theater or different types of stages because when we look at Shakespeare, for example, his theater was performed in more of an amphitheater to an arena type stage. And understanding what the stage looks like will help you when you're reading the plays to because it helps you visualize where the characters are in the on the stage where they're standing 
when they exit this way or they exit that way. They're walking in front of other characters when they leave the stage. Just those kinds of elements um, you can better uh, understand if you've got an idea. So as I said before, the proscenium stage is the most typical type of stage. And you can see how um, we've got the most of the action usually occurs in the middle of the stage. Um, towards the very front of the stage is called the apron. Um, then we have stage left and stage right. And if you look at house left and house right, what will you notice is that they are opposite. So house left and house right is um, if you were facing, if you were in the audience and facing the stage, it would be your left and your right. If you are on the stage facing the audience, that's what stage left is and stage right is. They are the, the left and right of the actors facing this, the audience. Okay? So the different types of uh, stages, the arena stage, and um, while this is an example of an ancient Greek theater, you would also see this type of stage, like if you've ever been to um, the Farm Bureau uh, uh, amphitheater, it's called an amphitheater, but it really looks like an arena. That's It's set up as an arena. The stage is down center and um, the um, uh, audience is around two-thirds of the stage on the sides and in the middle. An amphitheater, a traditional Greek amphitheater, is more like if you've ever been to a football stadium or seen soccer played professionally, those are, are more of an amphitheater type setup where all of the action occurs in this oval center and the seats kind of go up the side of the building and look down on what's happening in the center. So that's, that's sort of um, what an amphitheater looks like. Of course, in Greek time, they were much smaller, um, not the size of our football stadiums today, but it's that kind of um, configuration. So stage direction and exposition. Description is, in drama is usually limited to a few stage directions. These are the italicized descriptions of the set, character, characters, and actions. Um, so when you're reading a play, you will see these little in brackets, usually italicized directions. Those are stage directions. And they give you very limited information about where people are standing, um, which side of the stage they exit or enter from. Um, just really basic details like that. But important details like lighting, cosp costume design, music, um, tone, style, all of those are really determined by the director of the play, whoever is directing the play. The exposition or the background information that we get um, in a play is different than when we're reading a short story. When you're reading a short story, um, your exposition is often given to you by your narrator. Okay. When you are uh, reading a play, your exposition only comes through dialogue. You don't have a narrator per se that tells you, well, this is what happened three days ago and this is what is going on now. Um, you kind of have to figure that out from the actors talking to one another. So the different parts of the play. The play has a plot, just like a short story. Um, the invention, selection, and arrangement of action, that's what the plot is, unified by a sense of purpose that joins the character, storyline, and theme. So the plot is the controlling action. It sets up how the organization of the play. The play has some kind of uh, dramatic conflict, and the conflict structures the play. Um, and usually there are two opposing forces, good and evil, um, the yays and the nays, but two kinds of forces working um, to against each other or with each other towards some kind of goal. The typical structure of a dramatic plot involves five stages in the progression of the conflict. 
the exposition, which is the background information, the rising action, which is all of the information that's leading up to the climax, the falling action, which is all of the events that happen after the climax, and then the conclusion. Um, older plays such as Shakespeare's have five acts, but modern plays tend to have two or three acts. So, and in those three acts, all of those events have to occur. Character is another important element of reading a play, and the character is the imaginary person who takes part in the action of a play. Drama tends to compress and simplify the personalities of characters, often relying on types to quickly sketch out and draw contrast among characters. So, for example, um, you might have a motherly figure, as we see in the picture, and she's just the way she's dressed and um, the way her hair is done is all to look like a mom, okay? Um, the protagonist, the antagonist, we have heroes, heroines. Those are all the typical kinds of characters that you have. You might have a flat character that doesn't change or develop much. You might have a dynamic character that changes a great deal throughout the play. There are also some other types of characters which are called foils. And these characters are designed just to highlight qualities um, in other characters by contrast. Um, one of the ways I think of a foil is like um, Shakespeare or uh, other playwrights um, often have in a play the fool. And the fool is meant to um, highlight maybe the foolishness or, or the ridiculousness of one of the main characters. Um, and so that's a, a, a type of foil. Playwrights may use shortcuts like stereotypes to convey character as well. Consciously or unconsciously, we all rely on stereotypes at times to understand characters. So again, like I was talking about the mom figure, she's not like this, you know, um, uh, what do I want to say? She's not this real pretty, um, skinny, uh, high fashion model, but she's more matronly looking. She's more round and... Um, she has a, a, she doesn't have a regular a stylish hairstyle. She's got a more average type of uh, hairstyle. So she looks more like the average mom. Okay, so that's relying on a stereotype. Background speakers. When we read a play, we have to envision it in performance, and this is really key to enjoying the play when you're reading it. Is you really have to use your imagination. The reader becomes a kind of director, drawing on cues in the text to cast the characters, design the set, and imagine characters' intonations and physical actions. So, for example, you're not going to get um, uh, many stage directions that say, say um, a character crosses stage left, then sits in sofa. You're going to have to imagine... Um, a living room and a character um, delivering his or her line and what that would be. Would the character be standing by the front door? Would the character be um, sitting in a chair at a desk? Would the character be flopped on a sofa? Those are all kinds of details that you need to try to imagine when you are um, reading a play. The chief difference between narrative fiction, which is what we've been reading, and drama on the page is the absence in drama of a narrator. As I said er earlier, you don't have an omniscient narrator um, who can tell you exactly what happened or what people are thinking um, or what they're going to do next. All you can do is, is read the actions that they take or imagine the actions if there aren't any stage directions. And um, all you can know or understand about a character is what you get from dialogue. There's nothing else. Everything else you've got to kind of make up for yourself. So here's the typical kind of plot diagram. We get the exposition where something happens, there's some kind of conflict, and then we've got the rising actions where there are more events leading up to some kind of um, major event, and then the falling action and finally, we have the resolution where the things, uh, the problem at hand has been solved or 
um, resolved in, in some manner. So settings and costumes. Before the modern period, plays were performed outdoors in the daylight and involved very few pieces of scenery and little furniture or costume design. This is especially important when we look at Shakespeare. Um, uh, he frequently writes about uh, uh, wars that take place. And you couldn't perform a war on a small stage. I mean, you just it's not the same thing as, uh, you know, filming... Uh, a war battle um, in a movie. You've got a very closed set. You're not going to have tanks. You're not going to have horses. You're not going to have airplanes. So there has to be other ways that the author um, uses, like sound, for example, um, or a character talking about some event that has occurred to um, allude to these kinds of events. So when watching a play performance, audience must imagine that this stage set is actually a particular place or setting somewhere else. So you're not, very few plays, although there are some avant-garde type of um, plays where you would see this, but generally um, you're in a kitchen or a living room or a place of business. You're somewhere, and so you have to imagine that stage as being that place. And it may not have all the lights or all of the um, furniture that you would traditionally see um, in a film, for example. So you've got to kind of imagine that. I think that that's why I, I like reading drama so much is that it really is participatory reading. You really have to um, get yourself involved in it. If you just look at the words on the page, it's going to be a very flat experience for you and you're not going to really get a whole lot out of it. But by imagining um, what the characters look like, um, one of the things I like to do sometimes when I'm reading a play is think of um, modern day actors and who would be cast in a particular role. Um, and that helps you um, imagine kind of how they would perform the piece, walk around the stage, um, that kind of a thing. Unities. We have unities in plays. And these come from ancient Greek drama, which uh, said that playwrights had to appear to uh, adhere to classical unities. And that's unity of time, unity of place, and unity of action. So what that means really is that plays were supposed to represent a unified action that occurred over a short span of time, sometimes as short as the actual performance time, in a single location. Okay, Modern plays can use multiple settings and jumps in times. There might be gaps in time. Um, it might, you might get a sign that says three hours later or something like that, or something in the dialogue will indicate um, there might be a scene break or changes in the scenery, um, sound effects, stage directions, or notes in the program that give you information to tell you that time has passed or um, something different is, is happening now. And um, so pay attention to those kinds of elements because they will help you, again, visualize what's going on. Tone, language, and symbols. A play's tone is its style or manner of expression. And by that, that tone can be how an actor delivers his or her lines. It can be um, costume. It can be timing. Um, it, it can be any number of things. But tone is also affected by dramatic irony. And dramatic irony is when a character's knowledge or expectation is contradicted by what the audience knows. So the audience knows something that the character doesn't know. All right. And in Shakespeare, what he did a lot was he would have asides where characters would actually speak to the audience and give the audience information that the actors on the stage didn't have, supposedly. Situational irony occurs when the outcome of the action contradicts the character's 
and the audience's expectations. So you expect something to happen and the opposite happens, that situational irony. You might um, have a really angry, blustery um, character who's confronted with an issue and rather than yell and scream, that character bursts into tears. That would be situational irony because it wouldn't be what you expected that character to do. Verbal irony is the same kind of thing, only it's done with speech. Um, and so when speech and actions don't match, um, that means that's an example of verbal irony. Other types of language that you will see um, in plays are monologues. And monologues are extended speeches by one character, um, and they often contain images and metaphors and figures of speech. And they, again, all impact, all of these impact the tone of the play. Effective plays also use props and con costumes as metaphors um, and they to allow the objects to carry symbolic weight and to con convey key thematic points. So in other words, pay attention when you're watching a play, pay attention to all of the details. What do the characters say? But also, how do they look? Um, what, what objects do you see in the room? This will be particularly interesting and important to um, in the first play you read, which will be trifles. In trifles, it's really important to understand um, uh, or pay attention to the um, how the stage is set up and what, what elements are there. And you learn about that through the dialogue. The theme of a play is, is usually defined as a statement or assertion about the subject of a work and about the comprehensive impact of an entire work. So in other words, the way I like to understand theme or think about theme is once I've read a short story or a play, I want to sit back and take a minute or two and just think about it. And those images that come to mind, the uh, pieces of dialogue that come to mind, those are all those elements um, that have been presented to shape my understanding of and experience of the theme of the play. There are some genres and subgenres, types of plays. So a pastoral play um, idealizes the simple life. You know, um, think of it as they lived happily ever after. They um, uh, have a, a house with a white picket fence and a two-car garage and two point one children and everybody's happy. It's that kind of idealized life. A farce is meant to be silly, funny. Um, it can be slapstick, there can be physical humor, but it's just meant to be, it's not necessarily realistic. Um, and satire is when we are making fun of people or things um, and, and showing the weaknesses or the problems with that particular thing. Other uh, subgenres are tragedy and comedy. Tragedy is um, in a work is usually when one of the most important characters confronts some kind of superior force and comes to understand the errors of her ways. So that person learns um, a lesson of some kind um, and grows from an event that happens. And the comedy um, usually um, values expressed are typically the cause of conflict. Characters are defined in terms of their social identities and tend to be flat. Conventionally, conventionally it ends happily ever after with an act of celebration. Um, I'm not trying, I'm trying to think, I don't think we read a comedy per se, although you could argue that um, A Raisin in the Sun certainly works this way, follows these lines. It doesn't mean that it's funny ha-ha, but it follows the format of a comedy. So that's it for your introduction to drama. Um, I hope that you really enjoy reading these plays. I've picked some good ones for you, um, and I think that 
with a little bit of creativity and imagination in your part, you'll really have a lot of fun um, with these plays. If you have questions, post them in the discussion um, forum questions and comments, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.